This presentation includes forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially as a result of various risk factors, including those described in the 10Ks, 10Qs and 8Ks VMware files with the SEC. This is Charlotte. She's away at uni. Texts and chats with her friends a lot. Okay. Oh, but still talks with her mum every day. Okay. Bye, I love you. Yeah, she's a typical student. Her goal is to become a surgeon, and she's able to learn from the best instructors, wherever they are around the world. Now, Charlotte, I want you to scan your arm and take control of the device. See, it senses the smallest of movements, so you'll be very precise in surgery. Like that? That's it. Good job, Charlotte. For a break from studies, there's a herd of elephants she likes to follow in real time. Next summer, she's going to Shanghai. While her Mandarin needs some fine tuning, nothing will be lost in translation. Don't they sound fantastic? Or en route. Like that order of dumplings, delivered straight to her doorstep. When she's ready to head home, Charlotte can relax while the car does the driving. She's growing up in a world far different, but not that far off. A world made possible by innovative apps, many clouds, and a secure, scalable digital foundation built on VMware. The future promises wonder and excitement, but the real magic happens in crafting the path to that future. How will you make your mark? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ray O'Farrell. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Hey, it's great to be back here in Barcelona, second day of VMworld 2019. We've got a great series of demos for you here today, so we're going to drive right in. First of all, when you look at that video, what's important about that is to note how applications are at the very center of Charlotte's life. And the impact of those applications affect her transportation, where she chooses to eat, even her education. What we also got to remember is behind all of those applications, there's a lot of cool infrastructure and services which must work flawlessly and reliably to make all of that happen. But for Charlotte, it's around the user experience. And that user experience shapes her relationship with all of those companies who deliver the services which she consumes every single day. And these are not only tech companies. It applies across all industries. All of these industries focus on driving customer experience, and the heart of that is a transformation to leverage digital technologies to do that. The leaders of these businesses, they face a challenge. What is the best way to take advantage of the technology choices they now have presented to them? What they also realize is that failure to make the most of those technology choices, the most of those digital technologies, that's a missed opportunity. And it's an opportunity that their comp competition will take advantage of if they fail to leverage those technologies. So there's a pressure. There's an urgency to change. On the other hand, they have to be pragmatic. I want to go through this transformation, but I need to be able to keep my existing business running. So there's a series of challenges here focused on dealing with complexity. When I meet the leaders of these companies, broadly speaking, they break this challenge down into two areas. First of all, they express the challenge as, uh, challenge as, how do I build modern applications in a way that is repeatable, secure, and agile? How do I take advantage of all of this modern infrastructure, the diverse infrastructure which is now available to me, edge, public cloud, private cloud? And then across both of these things, they face the challenge, I need to manage all of these in a consistent fashion. How do I do that? How do I have consistent management across all of this diverse infrastructure? So sometimes complex problems need a complex solution. But for us, we break this challenge down into four distinct areas, each of which we are going to focus on here today. Now, I want to emphasize that because of VMware's broad product portfolio, 
we're unique in ability to be able to give solutions across all of these diff different aspects of this challenge. Now, I mentioned that this is not just a challenge or an opportunity faced by tech companies. It's every company out there. So in order to be able to take us through a journey and a story here today, we're going to look at a fictitious company, one called Tanzu Tees. And their job is to manufacture and sell t-shirts. Now, this is a somewhat simplistic view, obviously. We have two centers of digital infrastructure. One of them, the manufacturing and distribution, and the other one, how do I give this great online experience, the delivery of that online store? But even, th even in this simple example, complexity is driven by a variety of languages, variety of clouds, a variety of services. So we're going to focus initially on how they build and run these applications. And to get us started on that journey, please welcome Joe Bagley. How are you doing? Oh, good, Ray. How are you? Okay. So, Joe, uh, you've heard the story so far. Yep. What we're trying to do is understand, give a great build and run experience for Tanzu Tees. Mm -hmm. And to get really specific, I've got a specific problem I want you to tackle. How do I simplify the building of cloud native applications and infrastructure as code? Well, so unsurprisingly, I've got a demo lined up for that. I one thought you might have one. So, let's dive into the demo. What we're looking at here is Spring Initializer. Now, Spring Initializer is used for rapidly building applications. So let's start building one. What we're going to do is give a name to the project group, and then we're going to go down and start creating this shipping app for you within Spring Initializer. Now, the great thing about this is we're going to have a dependency on Postgres in this application. And down the bottom there, you'll see that we can put that in right from the start. So as we start to build this out, we'll make sure everything's ready for the developer to get going. Then what we'll do is that'll generate the code. So let's have a look at what the code looks like. When you look at this, what you're seeing is the framework is already for the developer. They can get right in to start putting that logic into the app. Yeah. So for the older ones amongst you, all the hash includes are already done up there right up front. So once they've then done this, put all their logic in, they then might use Git, for example, to trigger something like Harbor to then go and deploy that um, into a catalog. And um, this is where Bitnami comes in. After they've maybe used a like pivotal build service to do that, here you're looking at an app repository. And Bitnami allows us to manage large imagery reposit image repositories. And here you can see org-specific Bitnami catalogs. And these are enabled by Project Galleon that you heard Pat talking about yesterday. And this project's own KubeApps catalog that you can see here, which when we click on it, includes that same-day shipping app that we just built through Spring Initializer. And the DevOps lead for this project has actually curated this catalog or this view here just for their project. So when we click on this, we can see various details about that package. But more importantly, one of the options for deployment is we can deploy straight from this catalog. So if we look at this, we'll start filling in some details. And as we go down, one of the things we're going to do is select an on-premises Postgres, okay. which is you know, what we did before. And then right down the bottom, you'll see there's a tick for enabling metrics. That enables and starts to instrument this right from the build. So you can then hook things like Wavefront or other monitoring solutions into it right up front. So now we're done. We click Submit, and it starts to get deployed. I mean, we could have done this with VRA. There's been that in multiple different ways, but it's just one of the ways now we can speed this process up. OK, so this is how Tanzu Tees gets started on this journey of uh, basically building modern applications yeah. from start to all the way to deployment. OK? Um, of course, it's not so simple. I've got another problem here, right? You always do. Um, uh, since we want to use modern applications, we want to use containers, yep. and that's going to quickly get me into how do I manage at scale, and I want to be able to use Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. However, I've got multiple clouds, I've got multiple teams, and I would like a unified approach to how I manage Kubernetes across all of this. Well, of course, there's an answer for that too in the next demo. And this is where Tanzu Mission Control comes in, and this is where I start to get really excited. Because what you're looking at here is the Kubernetes clusters being managed across multiple public clouds. You've got Amazon, Microsoft Azure, Google, and VMware here, all in one view. And it's as easy as clicking to create a new cluster in any of those clouds from this console. At the same time, these apps are arranged into namespaces. And if we look at the namespaces here, you'll see a list of all the applications we've got. And it's really easy to go and create a new namespace for something like Tanzu Tees. Now here, you'd say, OK, in this namespace, we're going to be allowed to use these public clouds. Yep. 
So again, we're making it very, very easy for people to start to use multiple clouds with multiple Kubernetes clusters, but from one console and in one place. But actually, the real kicker here is about policy. And so let me show you how someone would do policy today. And what you're seeing here is all the consoles for all the Kubernetes offerings across all the public clouds. So to go and set policy, you'd have to go to each of these, multiple CLIs, there's you know, web interfaces, all manner of stuff you'd have to do to do this. But let's come back to the demo with Tanzu Mission Control and show you how we do that today with Mission Control. It's as simple as clicking to add a role and then setting it up and click done, and you can start to deploy automatically across all of those clouds. What do you think? So I think you're solving my problems <laughs> rapidly here, right? Yeah. Um, what I've got at this stage is I'm seeing how I can focus on my modern applications, how I can run Kubernetes at scale across multiple clouds. Yep. But I've got a lot of developers who are very familiar with vSphere, and I've got a lot of vSphere infrastructure, and I'm very comfortable with that. What I want to know is how can I run these new types of applications on that, uh, on that existing infrastructure and you know, leverage the familiarity and the skill set that those developers and those operators have? OK, so this leads us on to the next demo. And the next demo is Project Pacific. And Project Pacific is here to help you run Kubernetes natively in vSphere. So what you're seeing here is the native vSphere console, the same thing those 500,000 customers with all their admins are looking at on a daily basis. But now you'll notice something different. We're organizing these, these resources into namespaces. And you'll see here, if we click on one of these namespaces, you'll see all the pieces associated with that namespace. But more importantly, we can now start to set policy across an entire app namespace within the same console everyone knows and loves. Okay. So here, for example, we're going to go and set resource limits. Now, that's going to be set across all of the VMs and all the containers that are within that particular application, wherever they sit within this project. At the same time, down the bottom, you'll see a Kubernetes cluster. Let's click and have a look at the cluster in this namespace. Now, this is a console you'll all recognize. But on the left, it's looking a little bit different. Yep. What you're looking at here is a Kubernetes cluster in the vSphere console. And then underneath that, there's a VM. We recognize those, at least, yep. right? This VM is the Postgres VM, the one that we've been building the whole time, the one that's going to sit behind your Tanzu Tz app. But right beneath that, there's a pod. There's a pod of containers in the same console. So what we're really doing here is saying, OK, we've got one place that you know and love that you can come back to, and you can now operate Kubernetes clusters, your VMs, and your container pods all side by side. And the really important thing to highlight here is those containers are running natively on ESX. They're not nested in anything else. They truly are first-class citizens once in that vSphere cluster. And you know, we saw yesterday where Joe spoke a little bit about the performance benefits of doing that. So this feature, this uh, addition to vSphere, that's one of the coolest new features, innovations, I think, in vSphere in many years, right? And you've got you know, nearly 500,000 people using vSphere out there. So now they have a path to say, I can move into this new world, leveraging containers, leveraging Kubernetes in a way that is very familiar of them, taking advantage of that experience. Yeah. So who's using this? I mean, obviously, <laughs> VMware does a lot in this space. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, let's talk about what VMware's been doing at this. Obviously, we dog food a lot of this stuff. We use these things already. Yep. So at VMware, this is the Cork campus, by the way, yep. right? We put this up I here while we're in your, <laughs> your home country. Um, but globally, VMware, on a weekly basis, creates and destroys over 800,000 containers and over a million VMs a week. And we see those numbers are going to flip as we go forward. They'll yep. both grow, but more containers are going to start you know, being than there are VMs as we go forward into the new application landscape. But that's all being done natively on ESX, which oh. is really important. So look, people are going to expect VMware to do that because obviously this is our business, right? But yeah. what about our customers? OK, so of course we've got customers doing this too. And one of those leading the way is Swisscom. Swisscom is a Swiss telco, but they're also a cloud service provider, both public and private clouds. And they recognize that they're living in this multi-cloud world, and Kubernetes is the new standard for next-generation infrastructure. They want to offer native Kubernetes services to their customers from their public and private clouds. And they realized after a long evaluation, but more importantly, the fact they could get support from us, that VMware's Kubernetes offering was the best choice. And you can find out more from that um, and from Olivier from Swisscom himself in his session here at VMworld tomorrow. OK, so we should check out that session to get those details. Joe, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. So as we move to this next, uh, before we move to the next section, let's just quickly see what we heard here from, uh, from Joe. With Pivotal and Bitnami, 
we can see how we can simplify the building of cloud native apps and get your infrastructure as code. With VM VMware transmission control, we can see how we can manage Kubernetes at enterprise scale across multiple clouds. And with Project Pacific, this fundamentally new technology which is available in vSphere, we can run containers and VMs together natively in vSphere. Let's take a look at the next section. Now we want to focus on how do we connect all of these pieces together and how do we do so in a secure fashion. And to help me with that, please welcome Marcos Hernandez. Hi, Marcos. Hola, Ray. How are you doing? Excellent. We're back here again on stage. Yep. OK. So Marcos, what we're focusing on this stage is how to connect all the pieces of the infrastructure which Tanzu T's have together. But we've also got a constant focus on security. What is the best way for us to be able to do this in a secure fashion? And as in the other case, I've also got a very specific question. And my specific question is, how do I implement the security posture for Tanzu T's and one that's strong enough and flexible enough to deal with the threats that I know we're going to face. Let me show you a demo, right? Excellent. For my first demo, we are going to talk about or show NSX Intelligence, our distributed analytics platform for networking and security. In NSX Manager, we go to Plan and Troubleshoot to access NSX Intelligence. Here we see all the applications that are known by this NSX domain. But this view can be a little busy, so we're going to go ahead and filter for Tansu T's. Here we get a more detailed view of my app with the security groups and the flows, protected and unprotected, currently on the wire. But we can also see some badges and alerts on the flows and security groups. For example, in this first one, inbound flow from the internet, there is a protocol mismatch anomaly being detected by the system, as well as a remote code execution attempt. This is very serious. Between two of my internal security groups, I can see another flow with another protocol mismatch and also a port scanning attempt, whereas a flow with no badge shows no issues. In the security group itself, the system is also detecting a DHCP overflow attempt. This is a threat. So let me tell you what we're looking at here. What NSX Intelligence is doing is surfacing information that is being reported by the newly announced distributed IDS platform in NSX, which is an industry first. But we have more visibility into the platform. In the next screen, we'll demonstrate here. We can see the multi-platform capabilities of NSX intelligence. We see containers, VMs, and bare metal workloads. If we pick one of these endpoints, and we go to the flow and policies, here we're looking at layer 7 context information. And if you look at the third entry there, SSH is, SSH is being flagged. What's happening here is that SSH is running on a layer 4 TCP protocol or port that is supposed to be carrying Redis. And this is that protocol mismatch that we detected earlier. There is another tab that we can look at called the VM information tab. Here we can see the number of running processes into my app as well as the users. This is being reported by NSX Intelligence extracted from NSX guest introspection. And in the next screen, we see a, can see a visual representation of the MITRE framework, which is a common security framework for adversary tactics and attack chains for both security anomalies and intrusion detection. Really cool. Now, what do we do with all of this information? This is the best part of the demo. We can start a security recommendation for Tansu T's. We will discover the applicable flows for my app. And in a few seconds here, the system will recommend a set of firewall rules to be applied to the application to be secure. Let's pr proceed. In the next screen, we can decide where to place this firewall rule set in the overall firewall table. And then, and this is the coolest part of the demo, we can turn on simulation mode in NSX intelligence to before we apply this security posture, kind of understand what the effects of the security policy will be with my app. If I am satisfied, I can publish to the firewall, and then the configuration will be realized in the NSX distributed firewall. We'll see that next. Now, to close the loop, we can go back to plan and troubleshoot. And if we see green flows, protected flows, that means that NSX intelligence with just a few clicks helped me secure Tansu T's. Boom. Okay. 
<laughs> Thank you. So, so what I really like about this is this simulation mode, right? It, you know, the opportunity to be able to look ahead and say, okay, I'm actually going to take advantage of this or not. So powerful. Um, Tanzer T's, however, still got some more challenges. And one of the challenges I have, I mentioned earlier that, you know, we're under attack all the time. But it's hard sometimes to know, well, should I care about this one? What's the important? How do I begin to classify and get a sense of what vulnerabilities I, ha I have and the criticality of them across the infrastructures and the apps themselves? And I'm sure you've got a demo to help I you do. with this. Okay. So for my second demo, we're going to show Carbon Black Workload, okay. which combines the cyber hygiene of Carbon Black with the strong security services provider provided by App Defense. So let's take a look. We're going to go to a topology tab. And here, we can see the different tiers of my application and how they're communicating. For example, I can see how web is communicating with the internet. And there is also a reputation score being tracked by the system. In the next screen, we're going to see the processes and flows that are triggering this reputation score. In the topology uh, map, we can also see how the application is communicating internally. So let's go ahead and show that, how web is talking to app and DV. Now, the system momentarily is going to show me an alert. There is an encryption policy violation. So let's take a look at what that is. What's happening here is that the DV tier is communicating over an encryption, uh, uh, unsupported or non compliant yep. version of TLS, non compliant with my policy. So I may want to talk to the app owners to get this remediated. Now, App Defense can also report on vulnerabilities for the entire environment, across the entire environment. There are 4,000 or so uh, right now, which is a lot. Fortunately, the system also assigns a criticality score and filters the top vulnerabilities, which I think there are 14 right now. Now, if we go back and take a look at the, the one at the top of the table, we can see that there's some sort of issue, or there is an issue with Apache Tomcat version 9.0. And this is serious because this is the heart of my billing application. But the problem is, is that this application is in production. I cannot patch it just now. What I can do instead is use Carbon Black Workload to uplift my prevention profile, which we're going to do next. We're going to change it to stringent. And now what I've done is I've raised the security posture of my app. And to show you how this protects the application, I'm going to switch hats and now pretend that I'm a hacker. Typically, what hackers do is they run reconnaissance on websites to see what's weak and uh, vulnerable. Here, they're seeing that Apache Tomcat 9.0 version, and they know that this has a weakness. So what they're going to do next is try to gain shell access into the application. It's going to time out. And typically, that is because there is some sort of like ingest firewall protecting the application. Let's go ahead and see if that is the case. There is, in fact, we're going to see here in a moment, a firewall running. This is Windows Defender. Fortunately for the attacker, it is pretty easy to disable Windows Defender. We're going to do that here. Now Windows Defender is disabled, and now they're going to try to gain shell access again. It's going to fail again, but this time it's failing because we uplifted that prevention profile. So if we go back to the Carbon Black Workload Console, we can actually track that event. We can go to the Alert tab and see there should be an alert. There it is, uh, the first one. There, there, there was a policy violation, and there's a description of exactly what happened. And if we go to the Details tab, we can see the entire attack chain, as well, which was unsuccessful, by the way, as well as the rogue process that they tried to run, which is PowerShell, and it didn't work. So with this ray, we can prove how Carbon Black Workload can help you classify and mitigate critical vulnerability problems in your environment. And again, boom. <laughs> OK. So, so OK, this is impressive. Um, for, for someone who's been, you know, I, I've been at VMware a long time, and you know, we acquired NSX a few years ago. What you are seeing here is the scope of the advantage of NSX complying with App Defense now being compliant with Carbon Black. Very, very powerful. Yep. One of the other uh, major features or, or, or uh, new products that are tied into NSX, however, is SD-WAN and what we do with VeloCloud. Right. We didn't get into that in the demo, but can you tell us a little bit about what our customers doing with that technology? Absolutely. Together with VMware, okay. <laughs> Deutsche Telekom, T-System, Smart, SC1, powered by VeloCloud, is helping customers embrace digital transformation 
while they transition out of legacy private, uh, private infrastructure. This strong partnership complements their extensive portfolio with the sole goal of helping our joint customers. This solution can be leveraged to provide a globally available SE WAN coupled with expert business services. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Thank, thank you. you so much, Ray. Thanks, everybody. Adios. Okay, so what are we seeing here from Marcus? What we've seen here is that by leveraging VMware NSX intelligence, we're able to drive application and infrastructure security, leveraging that machine learning built into those technologies. And with VMware Carbon Black Cloud Workload, we get workload security that represents a merger between Carbon Black and App Defense. Powerful features that focus on connectivity, but also very much around the security aspect of that. We also said, however, one of the challenges that these um, uh, businesses have as they go through these transformation is with all the complexity, they're looking for a common and a consistent way to manage all of this. And to help me discuss that, please welcome Purnima Padmanava. Hi, Thank you, That's an incredibly long walk out there. That isn't is it? a long <laughs> walk. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Purnima, uh, obviously what we want to focus on is how to get consistent management across all of this infrastructure. And once again, to dive down into a specific question, Tanzu Tees is rapidly growing, and my challenge is, how do I manage all the complex microservices environment that I'm building and rapidly root cause issues? One of my biggest challenges, something occurs way up in what the user is experiencing. Okay. How do I quickly figure out which group of services are causing that challenge? I think I have the perfect answer. Great, thank you. So that is where I'd like to bring in Wavefront by VMware. Wavefront is an enterprise observability platform that allows you to tr monitor troubleshoot and remediate application issues, be it cloud-native application, complex microservices-based application, traditional applications, or multi-cloud applications. Wavefront collects millions of metrics from your underlying infrastructure and application, rapidly correlates, and identifies that specific point of problem very quickly. So why don't we take a look at the demo? Right here, you can see the Tanzu T's shopping service has a problem, yep. and you can, in context, drill down into that service and see that there are some metrics being shown. These metrics are being shown from Wavefront. These are called the standard red metrics, rate, error, and duration. And you can see latency has really spiked. So why don't we drill down into the shopping service and see more? Now, this is where I'd like to showcase a new capability in Wavefront called distributed tracing. When it is a complex microservices-based app, if you just have a mess of metrics, you don't know where to start. So you want to first pinpoint which microservice is causing the problem. So our guess is that it's a shopping service that has the problem, and it is dependent on other uh, services such as the pricing service. And when you look at the tra trace of the transaction on what is happening with the latency, you actually find it's the pricing service that's the culprit. So I have very rapidly narrowed down to the specific microservice, and now I can drill into more details there. And there you go. You do see a spike in pricing yep. latency. Now, right below the pricing latency spike, you can see a mess of lines. This is all the database queries that we have been collecting that contribute to the pricing service. Now, with Wavefront's needle in a haystack approach, you can rapidly, with a single click, correlate across these mess of lines that one specific query that's causing the problem. Right click, identify the query, send it to your developer through a Slack channel, they fix the problem, and you're off to the races. Now, we also see one more problem, that the I.O. wait times have spiked. And simultaneously, you can see that there is a storage latency that has increased. So at this point, we can switch into our infrastructure operations product, which is VRealize Operations. VRealize Operations is used to monitor, troubleshoot, plan, and optimize your virtual infrastructure. And now I want, I'm pleased to announce that we realize operations is available as a SaaS service in tech preview. Now, we have added a new capability here called Project Magna. Why don't we do this? Project Magna is an AI ML-based system. And let us go ahead and enable it, and I will describe what it does while we enable it. 
So virtualization has put very powerful set of capabilities at your fingertips, which you can fine tune to get the perfect performance for your application. But when you have many knobs and many applications, how do you identify that perfect setting for a given app? And then when you do fine tune for one app, how do you make sure it doesn't affect another? Or what happens when the workload changes? How are you going to make, go make the changes to the settings? This is a problem that is a hard one with exponential set of answers, perfect for AI and ML. So leveraging reinforcement te learning techniques, we create a model of your environment. And we learn from many, many, many customers. And, what, and that is what Project Magna does. Yeah. And using this model, we comb through the set of answers and I, I find the perfect setting for you that optimizes for your app performance. Now, as the application changes and workload changes, so does Magna. Now, right here, you can see the KPI has drifted down. That's the, green li the, the blue line. And Magna is saying that I can improve the performance by about 22%. So let us go and refresh the screen and see what Magna has done in the background. So if you can see the green dots, Magna has started taking action and improve, the KPI has started improving. Now in the background, when you see, there's a bunch of knobs and variables that Magna has controlled. And I'll give you an example of one. It has increased the cache size when needed and taken away the cache size when it was not needed. So it keeps the infrastructure always optimized. What do you think? Uh, pretty powerful. Mm. You know, I've worked in storage with one of my earlier mm. yes. jobs at VMware. And the fact that we now are able to have the infrastructure automatically begin to modify the parameters based on the workload, that is powerful. So very impressive. Thank you. Very impressive. So you've solved a series of problems for me around challenges in the application itself. You've shown me how we can, yeah. pro how we can automatically correct for some of those. But I sometimes have problems that are not really technical in nature. They've got to do with the cost and the economics of my system. Yes. I'm using cloud more and more. What I'd like to be able to understand is, how can I get good control and visibility into my cloud spend? And ideally, I'd like to be able to do so proactively. As my cloud spend begins to increase, I'd like some warning of that to be able to say, oh, should I adjust things? Should I change yep. how I'm leveraging the yep. available infrastructure that I have? I think that's a perfect question. Yes. <laughs> so we have, uh, this is where I'd like to introduce another solution, uh, Cloud Help by VMware. And Cloud Help is a multi-cloud management platform that gives you visibility, cost control, governance, and security across your multiple clouds. And it, it, is, it, it would help you uh, get to the answer. So back to the Tanzu T's portal, you can see that I can also see the cost of deploying and manage, uh, deploy, deployment costs for Tanzu T's. So let us go ahead and double click into the cost tab. And that takes us to Cloud Health. Now here in Cloud Health, you can see that we are deployed across two regions, east and west. And the western region, the usage, is tracking very close to the available capacity, right? But on the eastern region, you can see that my available capacity outpaces the used capacity, okay. right? So I'm going to ask Cloud Health to give me some recommendations to better optimize. And so if I go ahead and look into recommendations, right here, Cloud Health gives me a list of very specific targets, very specific VMs that I can either right size or I can reclaim, getting me back to a much better norm. Yep. Now you had asked another question, which was how do I keep track of budget? Yep. And that is where the governance component of Cloud Health comes in. Uh, with Cloud Health, you can set up a budget policy. Right here, I'm going to set up a budget policy that says that when my budget runs not over, close to 100%, okay. send me an email. And Ray, since you are the one who has asked, I'm going to send the email to you. Okay. So you know when the budget is in over. So at this stage, I'm getting this proactive warning. That is right. That's exactly what I was looking for. Okay, so we're seeing how with this technology in particular, I can get a handle on my broad cloud spend, the economics that I'm yes. looking, at there, uh, looking for out there. So how are customers using some of these technologies? Can you give us some example of that? Sure. Uh, let us look at one of our customers, Boss SaaS Studios. They are an online gaming uh, company. And with the switch of the gaming industry from single player to multiplayer, the applications became a lot more complex. Yep. Now they went to a containerized microservices applications deployed on-prem and in AWS. 
using Fargate and Kubernetes. So pretty complex environment. And what the SRE team was finding, the site reliability engineers were constantly just chasing problems. They were spending a lot of time trying to figure out which microservices where and which cloud location. So they deployed Wavefront by VMware, collect all the metrics, pour into Wavefront, and just Wavefront tells them the answers on where the potential problems are. They also use Wavefront distributed tracing to identify the specific microservice that has the issue. So now their SRE teams are spending a lot more time fixing rather than finding. Okay, excellent. Thank you for Nima. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. <laughs>So let's briefly summarize what we've heard from Pranima. With VMware Wavefront and Magna, as applications become more complex, we're able to leverage AI and ML to rapidly detect problems and, what's really cool to me, dynamically tune your infrastructure to deal with some of those challenges. And with Cloud Health by VMware, we can see how you can leverage this technology to help you manage and reduce cl uh, cloud costs and often in a highly proactive fashion. So at this point, we've spoken a lot about the technologies that Tanzu Ts use to deliver product and to build their products. But we want to focus a little bit on the experience of the employees who work at Tanzu Ts. And so to help me do that, please welcome Shika Mittal to the stage. Hi, Shika. Hi, Ray. How are you doing? Doing good. How are you? So, Shika, we're going to talk about employee experience. That's right. And um, it, as, again, in the particular uh, examples that we've had so far, we want to be able to dive into something pretty specific, right? So, Tanzu Tease is rapidly expanding. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we want to get, do is we want to bring on some new designers. But these designers are primarily used to working in an Azure environment. At the same time, I want to expand the call centers that I have. So I, need, I want two problems, so I've got two problems to solve here. One, I want to be able to bring on these designers, I want to bring in these call centers relatively easily. They're on different clouds. How do I work in a multi-cloud environment? All right, absolutely. So let me show you how VMware provides a multi-cloud digital workspace for employees so that they feel engaged and productive on any cloud, anywhere. Let's see the demo. So first things first, we need some infrastructure to run these virtual desktops on. Now, this is really easy. The admin simply starts at the Horizon Management Console and adds a new VMware Cloud site. She is taken to a simple wizard that asks basic questions like quantity, model of desktop, and that's pretty much it. And instead of a lengthy manual process, the Horizon site automatically goes live. And here is one that we created earlier. This global dashboard view is really convenient for the admin because she can see all multi-cloud sites in one place. As you can see, there is also a Microsoft Azure site in here. What's really cool is that Tanzu Tees can now bring their existing Microsoft Azure subscription, and we can create a Horizon site just as easily as we did on VMware Cloud on AWS. All right, next step, let's configure the desktop. Check out the new Horizon Image Management Service, which allows the administrator to see a global catalog of desktop images. Import and reuse an existing Windows 10 image from an on-premises site, and even replicate it to other sites in the future. And what about the desktops on Azure? Well, the admin can either import an existing image or even browse to the Azure Marketplace and select one from there. In fact, after our partnership announcement back in May, I'm very excited to share that the VMware Horizon service will now extend Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop, and we will support the Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session images. Check that out. All right, last step is to assign the desktop and the apps to the different users. Notably, check out how the admin can use cloud brokering and smart desktop placement policies to route different users to different sites. She can also configure minimum and maximum thresholds to optimize cloud usage. And then she selects 
some applications, and that's pretty much it. Now when the end user logs in to Workspace ONE, he will see tiles for the different desktops and the shared apps that he needs to do the, his job and hit the ground running. OK, so virtual desktops, they're one of the most common workloads that we see on VMware Cloud and AWS. That's right. So this is great to see this, now, this capability now be available on Azure. So very important to see this. I'm excited to see this one. Once again, however, I've got more stuff to worry about here. Sure. Um, so at this stage, you've showed me how to rapidly provision uh, uh, desktops, in particular, for, the, for my employees. But I'm also worried about the security of the devices they use, the endpoint devices that they use every single day. So I want to know what capabilities I have here to protect those devices and to protect the end users. Yeah, glad you asked that, Ray. Because one of the new employees, they were trying to access the design tool. And with one small typo, they ended up on an imposter site that infected malware and then redirected them back to the original site. This is your classic zero-day exploit. And it's particularly troublesome because it's a previously unknown vulnerability. But not to worry. This is where the VMware Workspace ONE comes into the picture. Let's see the demo. All right, check out how the admin is using Workspace ONE Unified Endpoint Management to manage all kinds of devices and apps in one place. There is physical, virtual, Windows 10, Mac OS, rugged devices, and much more. Now, looks like the admin has just received a notification about that zero-day exploit. All right, now what you're going to see is Workspace ONE Risk Analytics and Carbon Black and see how they're going to work their magic together. Carbon Black is able to report suspicious activity even though this was not a previously known vulnerability. And Workspace ONE, well, it uses sophisticated machine learning models to create a baseline for expected behavior. Any anomaly gets flagged and contributes to a risk score, which can then be used to set up conditional access. So let's see what's going on with these high-risk users that are marked in red. Sure enough, there is a spike in network activity. And if you scroll down, you're going to see that there has been a suspicious login attempt from Langley, and Carbon Black has reported suspicious activity. All this unexpected behavior raises Alice's risk score to high. But Workspace ONE really comes into the picture and provides automated tools to kick in here to remediate. And that's exactly what happened here. The malicious login was prevented, access to secure content was blocked, and a Slack message was sent to IT. Once IT is quarant has quarantined the device, they can safely follow up to ensure that no other device is compromised. And this is how, for the very first time, we have endpoint security with Carbon Black and endpoint management with Workspace ONE together giving us workspace security. So this explains why Alice was not able to give me the financial numbers this morning. Now I know why, but I've got the peace of mind of knowing that the device that was compromised was protected. Intrinsic security. Built in, very, very powerful. So just like in the other, um, uh, the other demos that we've had here, I'm interested in understanding about who is using these technologies. And of course, VMware obviously uses this technology. Absolutely. Could you give us a little bit of insight into that, please? Yeah, so we've been seeing all these demos, but this is real. You, me, and all of VMware, we use Workspace ONE daily. And so here's a fun fact. Did you know that VMware IT uses Workspace ONE to manage over 60,000 endpoints, over 1,000 apps across 125 global offices? OK, you know, Joe used the office from Cork. You should have tried something out from somewhere else in Ireland. <laughs> it's such a pretty building in Palo Alto, though. <laughs> so um, this is how VMware uses this technology. But what about our customers using these technologies? Absolutely. Here is Migros. Migros is a retail company. They have stores in across 81 cities, 45,000 employees, and a complex supply chain with 3,000 suppliers. They wanted to provide mobile phones to all their employees and real-time access to critical apps like pricing and inventory. But it was a struggle due to scale, security, overhead of management. Workspace ONE changed all of that. With Workspace ONE, Migros was able to use a single platform to manage all the devices and apps over a corporate network. They were able to successfully roll out a bring-your-own-device program, which gave the employees flexibility of choice, 
security, and Workspace ONE gave them full visibility and control. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ika. Thank you. Thank you. So you know the deal now. I'm going to summarize what we heard from Shika. Um, remember, the focus here has been on employee experience. And what you're seeing is how VMware Horizon Service allows you to rapidly scale with desktop as a service on VMware Cloud and AWS, but now also on Microsoft Azure. And with VMware Workspace ONE Zero Trust Security Model, we can deliver, workspace, we can deliver intrinsic workspace security and zero trust access, and all of this is leveraging our new carbon black capabilities. So when you look at this whole story, what you've seen here is that we've been working through the journey for this company, Tanzu Tees, to be able to say, how do I digitally transform? How do I produce great experience for the employees? But more importantly, how do I deliver product and have some happy customers? We've got someone here in the front row. There's a guy here I see wearing one of my Tanzu T t-shirts. Give us a model of that, Pat. <laughs> so, so with Pat as a happy customer, let's briefly go back and look at what we've seen here today as we've gone through these, se these series of, or this journey about making Tanzu T's digitally transform. First of all, what you're seeing here is with Pivotal, Vietnami, Tanzu Mission Control, and Project Pacific, we've seen how we're able to give you this powerful build and run experience. Joe went through that in detail. The demo showed how we're able to take you from beginning to end as that part of the story. From Marcos, we heard that with NSX Intelligence, Carbon Black, we can connect all of this infrastructure together, but do so with a focus on security. And then from Purnima, we heard how Wavefront, VROps with Magna, and Cloud Health give us consistent management across all of this infrastructure and across these apps, and not just from a technology point of view, gives you an ability to focus on cost management as well. And finally, from Shika, we heard how Horizon Cloud and Workspace One Intelligence gives you this great experience for your employees. Now, all of this is useless if it's not secure. And so what you've seen through each of these demos is a focus on weaving security into the demos themselves, demonstrating what these products do with a focus on security. It is built in. And that is what we, that is what we mean when we say intrinsic security. So at this stage, we've seen how VMware and its broad spectrum of products are able to solve real problems for you problems of how you go through a digital transformation with the technologies and the challenge that you face today. But you also rely on VMware to look to the future. What are those opportunities in terms of new technologies, new areas where you're going to want to, want to focus on? And when we think about that, what we want to think of as you look to the stars, what are those new areas? What, who is going to help you with, uh, with them? And of course, we want VMware to be part of that journey with you. You know, I've taken on a new role recently at VMware. I'm focusing on what we're doing with Kubernetes and what we're doing with Pivotal. And that gives me the opportunity to introduce our new CTO, Mr. Greg Lavender. Hi, Greg. Thank very you. welcome. Thank you very much, So Greg. you're going to tell us all about the future here. Well, I only have eight and a half minutes, so it's going to be a short future. Um, so I first want to say, you know, um, as the new CTO for two months now, having spent 22 months in this company, and having had a long 30-plus year career in universities, research labs, startups, decade at Sun Microsystems, a tenure at Cisco, and having been the, C the CTO for architecture and engineering at Citigroup as a customer, I can say that the culture of innovation that we have at VMware is the best I've ever experienced. Therefore, it's my privilege to be the new CTO of VMware and to lead our great R&D teams and our field technologists to enable you, our customers, to drive to the next level of innovation and achieve your business objectives in the new cloud era. So thank all of you very much and hold us to a high standard.
and hold me to a high standard as well. So in the office of the CTO, we get to do really cool things. That's what you would expect. Here's a sample of some emerging technologies that will continue to transform the industry and our society. And as you've heard Pat say many times, our goal is to be a force for good in that tra technological trans transformation uh, for the benefit of society. And today I'm going to focus on three of these areas that give you an idea or a sense of the art of the possible. So I spend a lot of time with customers like yourselves, many, many, many customers. And the, the one observation I can make is there's a, there's a large diversity of application types and workloads that need to run in lots of different places and the data, where the data is, is very important. So customers have to choose where to run those workloads. Do you run them in a private cloud? Do you run them in an edge cloud? Do you run them in a hybrid cloud? Do you write them cloud native? Do you basically build them as multi-cloud? For example, there's an emerging class of new workloads, which this is all the buzz of the industry. We talk about it all the time in terms of machine learning. And those algorithms typically require some type of hardware acceleration beyond what you get with a standard server. So uh, at VMware, we recently acquired a company called Bitfusion, not to be confused with Bitnami, which Ray just spoke about, and not to be confused with Bitcoin, which we are not doing at VMware. Bitfusion allows you to use remote GPUs and partition those re the resources of those GPUs to efficiently allocate those GPU resources across multiple workloads. On the left of the diagram, we have a VM running, in, in, running an ML application in an ESXi host with no local GPUs. Connected over the network to the right, you'll see that we have a cluster of ESXi nodes with two GPUs configured per cluster. We could have a lot more nodes in this cluster, but I'm just going to use two for this example. So using Bitfusion, the ML workload can connect over that Ethernet connection you know, to one or more of those clusters to basically grab those GPU resources that are being shared across the network. So let's see how this works. So uh, if many of you probably like me are a dog fan, I mean, Golden Retrievers are one of the most popular dog uh, breeds in the world. Uh, we have a database uh, called a ResNet a database of, uh, that we're going to do some training using a ResNet 50 model. Uh, ResNet 50 is a convolutional neural network image classification model, and we're going to apply it to this huge database of images of dogs to try and select out all the golden retrievers. So let's look at a VM configuration for the ML app that we're going to run in vCenter. So you'll notice in this, in this configuration, there are, no, there are no GPUs configured on the particular ESXi host. It's just a standard CPU that we're going to run this first uh, algorithm on uh, to do a, do a classification. So to run our model, we're going to use TensorFlow. Although you can run TensorFlow without hardware acceleration, the algorithm benefits greatly from GPU acceleration. As configured, our VM, as I said, doesn't have any local GPUs, and we want to use the ones in the, in the cluster that you see here. So we're going to show you a little screenshot here, because this, this is a technical demo. And uh, we actually started running this uh, algorithm when Ray first came on stage, and it's still not finished. And we're only processing 0.7 images per second. So this is using the standard CPU, not using any of the GPU acceleration. So we'll now see how Bitfusion can be used to connect to those across the network to those GPU resources and run the algorithm using the GPU acceleration that we've specified. So we use this command called flex direct. Um, that's going to connect over the network to those GPU clusters, and uh, we're going to ask for 60% of each of those GPUs, and then run the, and start running the algorithm again, and let it run here for a few seconds. So while the Tensor algorithm runs, we're going to show you the Bitfusion screenshot of actually the utilization of those two GPUs that are on that remote cluster, so you can see that they're actually being used, and the clients that are connected to them. As the workload finishes, it'll actually release those GPU resources, and other workloads can then connect to it over the network to, uh, to, use, to share those GPU resources as needed. So here we have the algorithm is finished running. As you can see, the maximum number of total images processed per second is 202 versus 0.7 in the previous example. That gives us a 288 times improvement of doing that. And so the key here really is that uh, you don't have to actually put GPUs in all of your nodes. You can put GPUs in shared clusters, Ethernet attached, recommend at least 10 gig network connectivity, 25 if you can do it. Uh, and that gives us the ability to do this type of acceleration and share those resources uh, efficiently. 
So let's recap what we just saw. Uh, the ML workloads can share attached GPUs in the network to give a high degree of utilization and ex on a, a, of expensive hardware. You also got to be sensitive to the power profile that those GPUs and those clusters may have on your, on your data center power consumption. And there are many more features coming in the BitFusion roadmap since we've acquired them. We're integrating it into vCenter UI to give you more native experience as system admins. And we're also working on integrating with in other industry standard FPGAs and ASICs to give you other options besides expensive GPUs for hardware acceleration of ML workloads. So uh, I want to look at another machine learning demo that leverages hybrid cloud. But first, I'm going to show you a high-level functional architecture that illustrates how a customer might go about doing that using all of the capabilities that we can bring, some of which you just saw, to the equation to give you a very rich platform on which you run machine learning, run machine learning workloads on premise. So partnering with Intel on hybrid cloud analytics, VM is working to, to build compelling solutions that allow you to leverage our latest cloud technology, some of which you just heard about, with the latest Intel hardware optimized for machine learning workloads. VMware Tanzu and Kubernetes together with VMware Cloud Foundation provide a platform that enables IT operations, data scientists, data engineers, and application developers to all work together to build intelligent applications, run them cost effectively at scale, and get the kind of performance like we just saw. So we recently announced also, I'm going to shift now to the, another demo where we recently announced uh, that we had, we're using RDS for VMware to enable database as a service automation for databases that you can deploy from a cloud-based management console, either in the public cloud or on-premise in your private cloud. Now, why would you do this? Data gravity and data sovereignty requirements often require that data has to remain on-premise, and you can't put it in the cloud for either security reasons or regulatory reasons. And we've had enough day two security events around data leakage in the cloud to know why this is important. So database admins and developers can use the RDS service on AWS to configure and deploy those databases on-prem. VMware admins can then manage those database resources using either the RDS user interface, the RDS APIs, or even uh, vRealize operations. So in this next demo, I'm going to use RDS to manage a local database, and then I'm going to run the popular HTO driverless AI platform to, to do a machine learning algorithm. So as you can see from the Amazon RDS service console, we have several databases under management. Uh, the, notice that two of these databases are configured in AWS US East, and other two are configured in what is called an RDS custom availability zone. Custom availability zone is actually on-premise. You can configure these on-premise in VMware infrastructure and in the, in the VMware cluster, and RDS treats it as a separate availability zone. We are interested in using this lone data database to do some prediction to see whether or not information in that data set would lead to loan defaults as part of the loan approval process. So let's see what the RDS managed loan database looks like in vCenter. So here's the standard vCenter console. There's several files here that are configured in this particular uh, ESXi instance that the RDS service provisions so that it can manage that resource on-prem. But one of those resources is actually the database itself. And furthermore, we have another, uh, another VM configured that uh, is, the, is, the, um, is the HTO uh, AI application that we're going to run against the data set that we export from that database into a format that HTO AI can process. And then we're going to train the ML model using this loan database. OK, so here we see the HTO driverless AI dashboard. If you've used HTO, this looks familiar to you. That's used to build the model and then does the best, best practice or pr predicts the best model to be used to detect the loan defaults. The tool is pre-configured uh, to find the model that gets the right result and gives us the best set of true positives. So the chart in the bottom right will complete in a minute as it selects the model and picks the one that has the highest statistical likelihood of, of the highest rate of true positives, in this case, 77%. That would run against that big database of images of, of, of dogs to pick out those, I'm sorry, that was the previous demo, of the pick out of the defaults against this particular uh, data set. So what did we just see? So leveraging multi-cloud services on-prem using RDS in the cloud to manage a local database service, running popular ML application workloads like HTO driverless AI, and the best part is you maintain data sovereignty. So rather than bring your data to the cloud, 
bring new cloud-based data management tool capabilities to your data. And this is, a, this is a trend I see happening in the container world, too, is you're going to bring your container to your data at the edge or wherever it lives. You don't need, always need to bring the data to the cloud. So to wrap up a little bit here, in the Office of the CTO, we have a team of dedicated computer scientists, software engineers, and all of our field engineers. They're working hard to create our shared future together. We work closely with our R&D product teams and partners like Intel to transition new technologies into our product roadmaps. Most importantly, we pave the way for you, our customers, to benefit from our significant technological investments and innovations. We're better together. Let's go out and make our mark.